Today I'm here as um, author of Dark Days, the story of four Canadians tortured in the name of fighting terror. Um, uh, my own involvement on these cases uh, began many years ago when Meher Arar's wife Monia approached me for support in her struggle to free her husband from Syrian detention. And, um, and it was many, many years later that, um, of course, we won two public inquiry, or one public inquiry and one secret inquiry into the, all of the cases. And, um, and then a number of chronologies turned into a book on the cases. Um, that work involved working very closely with the media, um, trying to initially um, keep media or reinvigorate media interest in the case of Meher Arar but then to um, work to try and combat a campaign of leaks um, and an attempt by Canadian agencies to uh, put Meher Arar, Abdullah al-Malki, Ahmed al-Mahdi and Moyed Nuruddin on trial in the court of public opinion because of course they couldn't put them on trial in a court where evidence was required. And through the course of that work, I came to um, get to know um, three people sitting here with me today, Jeff Salat, um, Brigitte Bureau, and Jacques Bourbeau. Um, and I'm just going to turn to them now and ask them um, first to talk about how they became um, involved in covering the story and when and how long that spanned for. And then we're going to uh, turn to a, a conversational um, discussion um, about the different um, sides, of course, uh, on how media covers and covered these issues. So, if I could start with you, Jeff. Good morning. Um, I, you know, like a lot of other people in the news business, uh, was immediately uh, pulled off of what uh, I was covering, uh, which I can't even remember how, what it was, but I was in the Ottawa Bureau of the Globe and Mail at the time when 9-11 occurred. We all uh, saw this as the, like the biggest story uh, perhaps of the, uh, the decade, uh, and it was something that required a lot of, uh, of uh, resources to be put into it for uh, uh, quick and uh, verifiable uh, kind of reporting to be done. Uh, so that's how I came to the story. Uh, the story of, of Meher Arar uh, was first reported in, in the Globe and Mail, and uh, it was reported as a case of a uh, Canadian whose passport had been um, uh, ignored by the U.S. authorities. So that's kind of where uh, I got into the story. Uh, Brigitte? And, and by the way, I'm just going to, I agreed to do this in English to make it easier for the flow in, of information and discussion with my colleagues, but at the end, with the questions, si y a des questions en français, ça va me faire énormément plaisir de répondre dans la langue de Molière, ça va être même beaucoup plus facile pour moi. Um, I came about this story in 2002, Ottawa, Radio-Canada created an investigation unit, and they asked me to be part of this new team. Talk about baptism by fire. Uh, my first story was my Rara story. Uh, I was asked to look into the treatment of Canadians and, and how government dealt with Canadians when they were taken and detained abroad because there was my Rara story, but there were other stories also. And it's in uh, doing that story that I met Monia Mazig, my Rara's wife. And, um, and then it started just a whole series of uh, interviews uh, with different diplomats, officials, uh, trying to dig up what was happening, because I realized then, too, that not almost nobody on the French side was covering this story, which I, I, I couldn't believe. And um, I, I had the privilege of having many exclusive interviews also with Maire So that's how I came about this story. I also learned in the midst of it all that sources actually lie to you right to your face. And uh, we will be uh, talking about that in the next few minutes. My name is Jacques Borbeau. I'm the Bureau Chief with Global National News. Um, I came to this story, uh, I believe it was on a Saturday, and there was a, maybe a two-column-inch little blurb in the Globe and Mail saying that a Canadian had been um, uh, detained in um, New York and then disappeared. And I just, I was really intrigued by that. How does that happen? And uh, there didn't seem to be a great deal of concern. And I ended up uh, contacting Munya when she was still in Tunisia 
Uh, I did, I think, two or three stories before she even gave, came back to Canada. And then I followed it all the way through. I was, uh, I was there when he arrived back in Canada. Um, I have interviewed him, uh, covered the judicial inquiries. And the one thing that's always st struck with me through this entire story, and it's something that I think we all wrestled with, is you're dealing with a very murky world. And uh, it pr presents a lot of unique challenges for a journalist. I want to turn to um, what we experienced as a, a barrage of what came to be termed leaks. Um, and first I'm going to refer to what Justice Dennis O'Connor had to say about that in his report from his inquiry. Um, following Mr. Arar's return, reports were prepared within government that had the effect of downplaying the mistreatment or torture to which Mr. Arar had been subjected. Both before and after Mr. Arar's return to Canada, Canadian officials leaked confidential and sometimes inaccurate information about the case to the media for the purpose of damaging Mr. Arar's reputation or protecting their self-interests or government interests. He goes on to talk about how that kind of misrepresentation continued when briefing Privy Council, senior government officials, um, that the RCMP would omit key facts um, that would have reflected adversely on the force itself. And I just want to also put this in context by reading part of the foreword that Meharar wrote for the book that I wrote, because I think the personal impact of what happens in the media on these cases is really important. Meher wrote, most journalists have written balanced articles and kept the stories alive. These journalists res deserve respect and applause. Others, unfortunately, knowingly or unknowingly, became instruments in the hands of anonymous Canadian, -American, Canadian and American officials whose agenda was to prejudice public opinion. These officials leaked a damaging mixture of selective, inaccurate and false information to journalists most of which was either extracted under torture was a, or was a pure fabrication. These journalists must know that the stigma created by those leaks will follow the victims for the rest of their lives. These journalists must ask themselves how they would feel if they were publicly slandered in the eyes of all society by a trusted authority. I am sure that an honest answer to this question is that, as sacred as it is, the principle of freedom of expression in the media is not absolute. It must be exercised responsibly, professionally, and within a framework of ethics that supports seeing the truth, as opposed to seeking to enhance one's reputation by destroying the reputation of another person. I found it extremely disappointing that the majority of journalists who wrote one-sided stories about these cases completely ignored the section of the O'Connor report that was most relevant and important to them. The section where he cites how unfair some media coverage was and criticizes the obvious pattern of anonymous sources steering public opinion through the media. The Canadian public has trusted you, the media, with tremendous power, so please use it responsibly and wisely. And you've, if you have to err, please err on the side of the vulnerable and the weak. So that's from Maher. And I think we all know, and as Abdullah has pointed out, that those leaks weren't just about Meher, they were about Ahmed al Mahdi, Abdul al Malki, and Moyed Nuruddin, and of course have happened in other cases as well. So I want to start with um, Jeff and ask you to talk about some of the experiences you had um, when officials would call you with information meant to damage Mr. Arar or the others' reputations. I'm going to tell you two stories. Uh, one I'm not very proud of, but the, the first one I'm going to tell you uh, is about the rumors that were circulating uh, at the time uh, that Maher was still in detention in Syria. Uh, we were hearing, those of us who worked in, uh, in Ottawa in the press gallery, many of us were hearing uh, rumors uh, that, well, you know, Maher Arar is, uh, in fact, a trained terrorist. He was in Afghanistan. They know that uh, he's uh, trained there. Uh, he has confessed, or he has said himself that that's what he has done. Uh, and these rumors, I think, in some ways, colored the judgment of, of some editors. Uh, they were unverifiable. Uh, the people who were spreading the rumors had no 
evidence, but they certainly had a big stake in trying to make sure that Meher Arar never came back to Canada. It, it's a story about the U.S. disrespecting the U.S. Uh, the Canadian passport, and that's it. You don't really want to go there uh, and ride on a, a, a horse uh, to defend Meher Arar. Well, we, because we couldn't verify it, and we couldn't uh, ask Meher directly to speak for himself, he was in a prison cell in Damascus, uh, we uh, did not uh, report this. Uh, and then as Monia Mezig and uh, Kerry's work uh, to bring the case to public attention gathered momentum, at some point the Prime Minister of the day, Jean Chrétien, decided that he wanted to find out what the hell was going on. Uh, and uh, he uh, sent uh, an envoy uh, to Damascus to try to uh, uh, secure the release of Meher Arar. But something else he did is he wrote a letter uh, to Monium, uh, Monia is uh, telling her that the uh, Canadian government will make every effort possible to bring her husband home uh, to Canada. Uh, and then about the third or fourth paragraph in Chrétien's letter to Monia, he said, uh, I am aware of allegations that he has tra uh, uh, trained in Afghanistan. Well, Monia came to me with, with this letter. Uh, she hadn't gone public with anybody else previously. Uh, and uh, she said, look, the government's going to uh, uh, finally do something to help. Uh, the prime minister says so. So this was big news. This is uh, enormous. Uh, uh, advance on the story, uh, and as I was writing the story, and I, you know, I guess even before I left Monia's uh, apartment, uh, uh, I said to her, you know, the Afghanistan rumor, we've talked about this before, uh, I know that you've told me that he's never been to Afghanistan, but if I'm going to report on this letter, I'm going to have to make mention to it, because the Prime Minister uh, has made mention to it. So. The lead, of course, on the story was that the Canadian government was going to try to secure his release, that the uh, Kretien uh, government was putting uh, uh, together efforts, uh, diplomatic efforts to get him returned. And long about, that's the lead, uh, long about the fourth or fifth, maybe even lower than that, sixth paragraph into the story, I quoted the Prime Minister's letter uh, saying that uh, he's aware of uh, uh, allegations that Meher had trained at a terrorist camp in Afghanistan. Uh, and I said, I can't ignore this part of it. But what I did was immediately frame it uh, with uh, Monia's uh, denial that her husband had ever been in Afghanistan. Uh, it might have been tempting to sensationalize uh, the, uh, the, the one reference to Afghanistan in Kretien's letter, but that would have been totally irresponsible. Uh, so I think given the circumstances at that time, uh, given the fact that Maher could not defend himself publicly, uh, but that the Prime Minister was making reference to this, we, we got it just about right, I think. Now, the, the, I'm going to tell the, the story I'm not proud of. Uh, when uh, Maher was uh, finally returned uh, to Canada and had uh, some time uh, to try to uh, uh, rebuild relationships with his family and uh, get back to some kind of a, a normal life, which of course is impossible. Uh, but uh, after a, a period of time, uh, Maher wanted to go uh, public with what had happened to him. Uh, he had been tortured. He had uh, uh, suffered unimaginable uh, psychic and physical pain. Uh, and so a news conference was scheduled, uh, and uh, I think Kerry probably organized that, and uh, uh, for two days hence. Well, I was going to write just a short little story about how uh, uh, Meher Arar was about to break his silence and go public with the news conference. And my editor is in Toronto, uh, said, well, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? You know, what about torture? Torture, you know. Uh, is he going to say he was tortured? Well, Maher wasn't prepared yet to talk about that. He needed that additional time of prep, I guess, for his news conference. Uh, but I phoned around to government sources uh, uh, on this, and I picked up from one that uh, in their debrief, the government uh, debrief of Meher Arar, he had complained about some uh, rough treatment, but he had not said that he was tortured. 
the source who told me this uh, told me this on the basis of uh, anonymity. He couldn't be named other than a government official. Uh, now, I had no idea at that time how damaging uh, this could be uh, to a torture survivor to have your suffering trivialized, denied, and it was uh, indeed a, a, a terrible blow uh, to Maher. Uh, and uh, as it turned out, when he did have a chance to speak for himself, uh, it wasn't true. Now, what did I learn from this? I mean, I had made a ba bad mistake. Uh, I should have waited. I should have uh, put my editors off, and I should have said, no, we will wait until the man speaks for himself. Uh, but uh, what I learned is about how to uh, work with sources. My source on this story uh, was granted anonymity by me uh, on the basis that uh, uh, he couldn't be quoted other than as a government official. Uh, and the information was false. Uh, Maher didn't was much uh, harsh, harsher treatment may her or suffered than being roughed up a little bit. Uh, now, I have been advocating now for uh, 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 quite a while uh, as a journalist, or more recently as my, my work at the journalism school at Carleton University, that we need to uh, renegotiate our contracts with our sources that we need to say, okay, we know that there are times that it's important, the information that you have becomes public, uh, but uh, you also have to be protected as well. And that the, part of the contract is uh, that you talk to me, the journalist, tell me the story, uh, I'll protect your identity, but if I find out you've lied to me, the deal's off, and I'm going public with your name. Now, I couldn't do this retroactively with the, uh, uh, the source in the uh, uh, Arar uh, case. Uh, but I think it's a good practice that, uh, because we've seen in, uh, in Ottawa, uh, in various areas, national security, political uh, reporting and so on, uh, these blind quotes from people who are uh, granted anonymity and uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, we, we just have to get the balance uh, or renegotiate the contract more so that we are indeed uh, giving people notice that you cannot abuse uh, the, the uh, press, you cannot abuse uh, the, uh, the appetite of uh, journalists uh, for a hot story uh, and feed them lies uh, and get away with it. When I wrote my book, I pursued a number of journalists who had published um, some of these um, pieces, these leaks, these so-called leaks, um, and a number of them expressed regret. Very few of them apologized publicly, so I think um, credit is due to Jeff Sellett for doing that. Brigitte, um, one of the people I spoke to, um, Robert Fife, um, talked about how he still believes today that his sources believed what they were saying when they were feeding him information. And you have a story um, to tell about one of the sources that you were dealing with. Almost every time I was on the air talking about Mère Ara, um, I would go back to my desk and the phone would ring. Pick it up and it would be an RCMP officer. And he would tell me, I just heard you on the air, didn't like what I heard. You're not telling the whole story. Why is it that you're just presenting Maher Arar's side of the story? And he said, I've told you before, Maher Arar is not an angel. Why is it that you never quote me on this? And he'd say, we have photos of Maher Arar training in Afghanistan. And I would say to him, show me the photos. And he'd say, I can't, they're confidential. I'd say, okay then, come on air and give me your side of the story and name yourself like Maher Arar and Monia Mazig are doing. And he say, no, I, you can use what I'm telling you, and you can say it's coming from an unnamed source, from a confidential source of the RCMP, but you must not name me. I refused, he kept calling. It was not fun <laughs> getting those calls from the RCMP. I did feel the pressure from these guys. 
um, to go ahead and, and talk about their side. Of, uh, what they said was their side of the stories. When RCMP would come forward and, and have public comments where they would have, you know, an RCMP officer with his name, I'd be more than willing to listen to what they had to say. I didn't like the way this guy was functioning. And we never did, I never did talk about the so-called photos in, uh, of Maher Arar training in Afghanistan. It didn't feel right. You know, I hadn't seen the photos. The guy wouldn't, you know, uh, agree for me to name him. So it just didn't feel right. But I think that what also helped me tremendously in covering that story was the code of ethics of Radio Canada CBC. We have a journalistic standards and, and norms and practices, I think it's called in English, and where it guides us in situations like those. And one of the guidelines in that code stipulates that you must not go on air with information that has been provided to you by only one confidential source. That if you are going to use that information, you must have it validated by a second source that is independent from the first one. So it can't be two police officers from the same you know, detachment giving you a call and saying, hey, I've got photos. So we never, we never did go on air with this. Now, one thing that is, is worth mentioning is that later on found out that the RCMP officer who kept calling me, who was quite um, firm and, and insistent in his dealings with me, he really believed that Maher Arar was a bad guy because he was told by his bosses that Maher Arar was a bad guy. He was told by his bosses that there were photos of Maher Arar in Afghanistan and his bosses were telling him to call me and probably other journalists with this information. And, and, and in the RCMP, CSIS, and all these agencies, they deal on a need-to-know basis. They will only give to officers what is strictly necessary in a certain context about an investigation, so, so as to uh, prevent leaks. And uh, anyway, in this instance, after there was the O'Connor inquiry into uh, what happened to Mayer and all the dealings with the RCMP, that's when my contact realized that he had been lied to by his superiors. He had been lied about the photos in Afghanistan. He had been lied about other aspects of Maher Arar's story. He had been lied about other stories because there were many other controversies that were coming forth in this same context and in the same era uh, concerning uh, RCMP and uh, Commissioner Zaccardelli at the time. It made him sick. Literally, he left the force, couldn't handle it, when he realized that not only had he been lied to, but he had found himself lying unknowingly to a bunch of people, including myself. And, and I called him uh, a little while back and I asked, I said, listen, here's what I'm gonna be doing in a few weeks. Do you, uh, do you agree with me telling this story? And he says, you know, after all these years, he says, go for it. It's a good story that needs to be told. So. There you go. It's one of the many experiences we've lived through uh, with our contact with RCMP and, and CSIS during, uh, during this whole affair. Jacques? I, um, I think one of the problems with in, in, this, uh, in this case for journalists is that uh, most of the leaks were not documents, um, things that uh, uh, it would be easier to, to deal with. A lot of it was done verbally, and as Brigitte uh, pointed out, um, trying to double source it was pretty much impossible because the only other people that would have knowledge would be other security agents and they were all getting information from the same source. I mean, one of the things I think that, that does protect us is that I think every journalist understands when you're given a leak, there is an agenda attached to it. And I think that responsible journalists uh, understand that and f frame their reporting with that in mind. Um, and, you know, when I would hear the rumors about the Afghanistan uh, trip by Meher, um, I would immediately ask, do you have pictures? Can you provide pictures? Can you provide a visa? Can you provide a passport stamp? I mean, when we travel internationally, we leave a trail of coo coo cookie crumbs that are, I believe, any security agency would easily be able to pick up on. And uh, that was never provided. And I want to pick up on what Jeff uh, was talking about when that source told him about rough treatment. And I want to introduce the idea that sometimes uh, when you get a leak like that, um, 
I think it, it, it does have value and, and, and should be put into the public domain, but it's all the way you frame it, right? And I think, and I think Jeff alluded to this as well, um, if he had waited until Maher had spoken publicly, and I was, I was at that news conference, and it was incredibly powerful, and then you say that before he, he, he came forward and, and said this, I had a government official to try to minimize this and say it was rough treatment, because I think that's important for the public to know that behind the scenes, even at that late date, the government was trying to minimize uh, Meher's story and his experience. And I think that is something the public needs to know, but it, it's, it's all in the way that it's presented it and it's the context that you give it uh, that, that I think is important. And I think that has to be part of you know, our, our evaluation of these kinds of things. One of the, uh, the things that I uh, want to underline is that uh, documents are not necessarily proof. Uh, I learned this a long time ago. I covered a lot of the RCMP security service uh, capers in uh, Quebec in the post uh, uh, FLQ 1970 October crisis. Uh, and we learned from an earlier commission of inquiry, the McDonald inquiry, uh, that these Maoris, the people in the security service, lied and they put it down on paper. They lied to their superiors, they lied to themselves, they lied to their ministers. So a document is only proof that somebody has written this. It's not proof of the facts uh, that are alleged within the document. Uh, and so we have to be very careful about the provenance of, of these documents. One of the um, really horrifying things uh, about what had, uh, occurred uh, in Quebec was that the RCMP security service in Montreal uh, forged and distributed a fake FLQ communique threatening additional uh, terrorist activity. Uh, and I can't even remember what their excuse was for this, but it, there is no excuse for it. Uh, this is uh, uh, an attempt by a government organization uh, to, well, may it not have been their, their intent, but it, it stirs the pot. It gets people uh, worried about uh, terrorism, uh, terrorist activities that haven't really occurred. Uh, and uh, uh, so we always have to uh, have that in the back of our mind that we, if we've got a document, have we got somebody who's going to stand behind it and, and uh, uh, somebody that we can identify? Also, to put it back in the context at that time, because Everybody here is probably very open to what happened, very knowledgeable. But we were also dealing with the larger public. And I, I remember in particular this one lady who was almost as disciplined as the RCMP in calling me after my stories, um, who would yell at me and, and tell me that I was a no good person, that I was defending a terrorist, and how dare I, and I should be ashamed of myself. And you had people that were very scared out there, that had seen, you know, the the Twin Towers in New York, and they couldn't believe that they're here. There was this Radio-Canada reporter on the air talking about Maher Arar and raising certain questions and, and you know, questioning the RCMP's approach, approach to it all. Thankfully, we also had uh, listeners and, and viewers that understood that what we deemed unacceptable in all of this was the fact that you had a Canadian citizen that had been sent to torture in a way to get information, something we felt that should not be done in a democracy. That if police officers believed that they had anything against Maher Arar, then they should bring him before court so that they can present their proof and that he could uh, present his own and defend himself. And we were doing this story on that basic, that we were not defending necessarily a man, but the process in which things should have been done that this should go before the court. What kind of country were we becoming if we were sending somebody to torture to check if you had anything to say? And that's the basis on which we were doing our stories. I, I think that's an incredibly important point because in my, when I started doing these stories, um, I thought a lot about them and what it was it that I was trying to say. And to me, this entire 
uh, case is about due process. And uh, frankly, I was agnostic as to whether Maher was guilty of anything or not because I wasn't in a position to judge. I mean, I had spoken, we all spoke numerous times to Munya, who was adamant that he had you know, nothing to do with any sort of terror activity. Um, but none of us had an opportunity to speak to him directly. None of us had a, you know, a, a access to the, to the intelligence files. So to me, uh, it w and when I had people complain and say, you know, you, you know, aren't you concerned because this guy could turn out to be a terrorist? And I, and I, I would say, fine, but that should happen within Canada. And that's the problem with this, with this case, is that we, uh, we denied a Canadian citizen that due process. If he did anything wrong, he did it on Canadian soil. And I'm just asking the simple question, why is he not facing whatever accusations are out there here in Canada? Why is he in a, in a prison cell in Syria? And uh, I mean, frankly, that was the, the question that those in, in positions of authority had a very difficult time answering. As we were working on the case, it became really clear um, to those of us working very closely on this on a day-to-day -day basis that um, that it wasn't Mayor Arar who who ha there was any evidence of wrongdoing around, but that it was actually the security agencies. And we all began to see the leaks as a campaign less about smearing him, but to detract attention away from what they had done wrong, what they were doing wrong. It was a cover-up. And one of the most interesting stories to come out of the whole affair um, actually has a lot to do with Ahmed Al-Mati um, more than, than Meher Arar, um, and actually highlights the difference between the information they wanted to keep away from the public, um, the difference between that information and the information they really wanted um, in the public eye. And, and this is the, the, the contrast between what we came to know as a national security confidentiality censorship um, and, and the leaks. And I th this is a fascinating comparison for me. Um, and I'm going to ask Jeff Salat to tell the story of one of the, really one of the most tragic, but also at the same time, best days <laughs> in this whole sordid story. And that's the day that he discovered the true origin of this map that had been hyped as being at the root of all of what had happened um, in these cases. And Jeff, if you want to tell the story yeah. about that. Please. Just a, a bit of background. Um, uh, Mohammed al uh was a truck driver. He is a truck driver. Uh, he uh, was stopped uh, going across the uh, Canada-U.S. border, going into the U.S. on a, on a job, a delivery. Uh, and uh, he was uh, uh, questioned, uh, and the uh, officials, uh, the customs uh, officials in the United States uh, found in the cab of his truck, uh, in the glove compartment or somewhere, th this map uh, showed facilities in Ottawa, uh, facilities at Tunney's Pasture. There was a military uh, facility there. Uh, there was uh, an Atomic Energy of Canada uh, facility there. All of these kinds of government institutions that might in fact have been really nice targets for terrorists. Uh, the map was uh, even more cryptic. It had uh, on it uh, certain numbers uh, and combinations of alphanumeric things uh, that might have indicated where you're going to plant the bomb or where the terrorists will meet or whatever. Uh, but it was a very um, a disturbing uh, bit of uh, information that the Americans uh, at the border caught up to, uh, found, and uh, passed it on uh, to Canadian officials. Now, in the post-9-11 uh, world, uh, I guess we're still in the post-9-11 world, uh, the um, there was a lot of, uh, of uh, speculation going on uh, and information being slipped to reporters uh, uh, on the QT and so on. And one of the things that uh, was uh, frequently mentioned when 
uh, there was any discussion of, of Canada and possible Canadian uh, terrorists being involved in something, uh, one of the things that was mentioned was this story about this guy uh, who had this map, and this map uh, uh, showed targets. And uh, I mean, in the retelling, it became, uh, you know, an incredibly sinister. And uh, a number of people uh, went with this, uh, and uh, you know, Seymour Hirsch, who. Uh, exposed uh, a massacre at My Lai in Vietnam, a very distinguished uh, U.S. journalist, uh, fell for this story as well and made reference to it in a piece that he had written for The New Yorker. Uh, uh, Mohammed saw the story of the map appear on his TV screen. Uh, he was watching the news, and the, the news crawl talks about uh, Canadian terrorists with map to bomb, you know. And he, he kind of realized, holy cow, this, you know, they're, they're talking about what happened to me. Uh, so the story was out there. It uh, certainly didn't reflect well on uh, Muhammad. You know, what kind of map I is this? Uh, and uh, I thought, well, look, let's try to find the map. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that Barbara Jackman is here uh, today uh, because she had just inherited the case. Uh, uh, she was defending uh, 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 Mohammed and um, he um, had a lawyer, a uh, previous lawyer, who had boxed up all kinds of stuff uh, and uh, sent it on to uh, uh, to Barb. And uh, she actually found in there a copy of the map and uh, uh, faxed it to me in Ottawa. And I went out to Tunney's pasture to kind of find out what's going on there. Well, uh, it was an old map. AECL was no longer there, uh, and these mysterious cryptic kind of uh, alphanumeric things uh, were the numbers for the various parking lots. Uh, I went to some of the commissioners and I said, you know, here's this map, what, what is it? And they said, oh, they, you know, that's an old map. Here, let me give you a new one. We give this to all the truck drivers who uh, want to uh, make deliveries here. So what had happened is the person that uh, had use that truck previously, got this uh, handout map uh, from the commissioners, uh, and all the sinister stuff uh, was in fact uh, the, uh, you know, parking lot C2. So we were able to uh, report that. And that changed the course of the, the inquiry that was underway at the time, um, which I think the map was part of what changed that, um, the course of that inquiry, and, and I think it led to a whole bunch more hearings because, of course, it exposed even more of the pattern um, that was becoming very obvious, that this wasn't just about Meher Arar, this, that there was a pattern here, that there were three other Canadians who had been targeted by the same investigation um, and who had also been tortured. And um, so that's a very important story. Um, there was a bit about a mosque and a, and a Catholic church that you were going to oh, talk yeah. about. I mean, after, yeah. A, yeah, after the, uh, the story appeared uh, in the paper, uh, I got a, uh, an email from somebody who obviously knew a bit about this uh, national security stuff, uh, just uh, in references to things and, and the way it was uh, framed and so on. Uh, this was somebody who uh, was either on the inside in the government or was very close to somebody uh, who was on the inside, you know, maybe a spouse or something like that. And I, uh, the, the email uh, castigated me for being such a bad reporter uh, that uh, I had failed to notice that, you know, uh, the Tunney's Pasture uh, so-called target area was just down the street from the main mosque in Ottawa. And I looked at this and I said, how did I miss that? Gosh, uh, it's also down the street from a Catholic church and a number of other uh, religious institutions. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about today is the difference between a whistleblower and someone who's intentionally leaking information to benefit people in power. I'm wondering, Brigitte, if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, because the, the O'Connor report writes at one point, the practice of leaking confidential information is wrong and inexcusable. Now, I know that was written in the context of the inquiry by Justice O'Connor, but 
As a journalist, I cannot agree with that statement. Um, and, and I don't want it to come out of this that, oh, we don't want leaks and we don't want, no, not at all. But, and I'll give you an example of this because one of some of the most important public stories, uh, public interest stories have come from leaks from uh, governments, uh, bureaucrats, or police that feel that their government is trying to hide something that is extremely important for the public. And I think one of the most spectacular recent examples of this uh, come from, comes from my colleagues of the show Enquête at Radio-Canada in Montreal that led uh, to the, the Charbonneau Commission. Now, these journalists talked about the, the corruption in the construction business that was linked to government officials. Now, these journalists could never have done the work that they did were not, if it hadn't been for bureaucrats, uh, police officers, and other people, their sources, who felt that um, there was a big cover-up of everything that was linked to corruption in the construction business. So it comes back to, but when, when they would get these leaks, they wouldn't run to the microphone with this story then you have to do your job, the, the less glamour part of the journalistic job, where you become basically a, a library rat, or you're just sitting at your, at your computer and you're digging up and you're trying to verify the information. So you do need those whistleblowers, but you have to, as a journalist, do, do dil diligence. You have to check and double check and take the time needed. Now, in this day and age, I won't lie to you, there's a huge pressure to work uh, lots and fast and to go on the air with the information you have. There's a lot of competition between networks. Um, but at the end of the day, you do have to do that journalistic work. And, and again, thanks to our code of ethics, we, we try. I'm not saying we'll never do a mistake or we have never done mistakes, but they do try to limit the damage. But we have to check those sources, keep them coming, the brown envelopes, I do like them. <laughs> But I will check very thoroughly what you do, do send along my way. And that's the thing, anytime I get a leak, the first thing I do, as I've referenced before, I'm trying to figure out the, the agenda of the person leaking it, because I think that's so important. And uh, as Brigitte said, uh, due diligence is, that that's, getting the leak is, is one thing, but you have to perform that. And I know, I know that the more that I perceive and there is an agenda of the person leaking the information, and if I decide that there is some substance to what they've given to me, uh, the more neutral my reporting is, um, to the point where I've had people leak things to me and then they're angry that the way I framed the story because it wasn't framed in the way that they wanted it, which actually I take as a compliment because the, 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 that to me is my, that, that's how I sort of inoculate myself uh, in terms of uh, if my reporting when I know that there is an agenda attached to it is I just, I, I, I try to make sure that my reporting is completely absent that. Because at the end of the day, once the information is public, if that person then wants to use the information in the public domain to pre present their spin, you know, feel free. But that's not my job. I wanted to move along in the conversation to the current context um, and whether we think that the lessons learned around the Arar case, um, whether we're seeing the same kind of problematic um, reporting happening now in the current context, um, and what, if any, impact you think that will have on how we cover, for example, the introduction of, in, of new legislation um, that would afford new powers to the RCMP, CSIS, and other national security agencies and law enforcement agencies without oversight. Um, I'm wondering if, if any of you would like to comment on what that means, what it means, whether, we've, whether the lessons learned, whether you think they're being applied now. I, to, to tell you the truth, um, Carrie, I don't know if there have been any lessons learned. And, and that's the sad part of all of this because um, just last year, I was um, lesson learned from the whole Maire story and, and the inquiry and the reports and so forth. Um, I was talking to a political staffer from, I, I'm going to try to limit where I tell you, I see he's from, a political staffer, let's just say, that deals with national security issues. Met with him, he was trying to talk to me about stories that I might be interested in. And he was giving me little tidbits, stuff I wasn't 
I didn't deem important enough. And I said, you know what? Um, what I'd really be interested in is if at one point your government was interested in implementing the O'Connor recommendations, um, that I would be, you know, really interested in. And he looked at me and shrugged his shoulder, O'Connor. I said, well, you know, the O'Connor inquiry into Maharara's story. And he goes, I'm sorry, I, I don't know. <laughs> I swear to God, I had a shiver just because I thought this guy, young guy, still, uh, powerful job on the hill, just remembered vaguely who Maharara was and had no recollection of a report with a series of recommendations saying that there should be oversight. So that told me that, and, and I've had this experience after that, talking to MPs. There's a whole new bunch of MPs on, on the Hill talking to them about Maharara and the follow-up to the O'Connor inquiry, the fact that the recommendations haven't been put into effect, and all you get are blank stares. Some people do know, but many do not. Either they don't remember or they only have a vague recollection of the event. So today is extremely important in that aspect. So you, you, have, you have that aspect. So, and, and I find, and I know Jacques doesn't agree totally with me on this, but um, I find that we are back now in a very similar situation that we were in uh, after September 11. Now, two soldiers that died on Canadian soil. It is extremely sad, but it doesn't have, you know, it's not as big as what happened September 11th. But what I do feel is very similar to then is the climate of fear and, and, and uncertainty we were living then. And at that time, the government did the same thing. They went ahead and gave more power to the security agencies. Now, 10 years ago, and eight years ago when the report came out, came out it, they were asked, the governments, to go ahead with more scrutiny, more surveillance of these agencies. That has not been applied. There were certain changes at the RCMP, but nothing to the extent of what the O'Connor report recommended. Now we find ourselves with a government that is asking for more, that's going ahead again, with more powers to these agencies, and there is little talk of oversight again. And the only thing that reassures me a little bit in all of this is I have been reading many uh, security experts uh, articles that they have written where they raise the issues. It's not coming from uh, necessarily parliament, but it's coming from security experts, uh, university teachers that are saying, come on, there was an O'Connor report and guys, you should go back to this and apply it when you are going to be giving those powers. Now, our little team, my producer, was going through numbers recently, and we were looking at the budgets of, of CSIS and RCMP and uh, Le Centre de la Sécurité des Télécommunications, in English, Security, CSEC. Um, and their budgets have just, like, really, really increased. The watchdogs have not increased at the same uh, rhythm. And in certain instances, we, we did stories on this where you had watchdogs that were not even, one died at one point, and he wasn't replaced for months. So you had these very powerful agencies and with very little oversight. That has not changed. And there's not much right now in the public opinion asking for this at this point. So that is what I find a little bit alarming. I think the one difference we have to acknowledge is that um, after 9-11, um, we were dealing with an extrajudicial process, um, and one that, uh, frankly, there had been really no public debate. I don't remember parliamentary hearings or committee hearings on extraordinary renditions. This was a policy that was just engaged in with really uh, no discussion at all. Um, this time around, uh, the government is very clearly indicating it is going to be introducing legislation to give more powers, but at the very least, we're going to see legislation. It will be drafted by by bureaucrats. It will be uh, examined by by the by parliament. It will be subject to charter challenges. So that's you know, I think a significant difference. That being said, I agree with Brigitte. It's uh, the oversight is going to be the critical question because if you are going to be increasing uh, the uh, powers to the various security agencies. I think uh, a lot of politicians on, on the Hill are arguing that you have to, in lockstep, increase the, uh, the, the capacity 
of uh, oversight agencies to make sure that those uh, additional powers are exer exercised responsibly. It's uh, on, on this issue of oversight, uh, it's a couple of thoughts. Uh, politicians live in fear of um, appearing to be stupid in front of people, including their officials. Uh, there's also, because of our political system, a regular churn of uh, uh, who's in what portfolio, what party's in power, what, uh, uh, who's the minister responsible for this or that. Uh, and so the bureaucrats are always uh, in the position of being able to educate uh, the new minister. Uh, now we have seen uh, repeatedly uh, examples where uh, ministers have been misled. Uh, and. There has also been a very disturbing uh, report uh, released just a couple of days ago in Parliament, the Security Intelligence Review Committee, which does have the legislative mandate to look at uh, what CSIS is doing, uh, reported that in uh, at least one instance, um, help me on this, was it just one or, or was it more than one? Uh, at any rate, the Security Intelligence Review Committee itself had been seriously misled. Uh, material information about uh, one of its investigations was deliberately withheld by, uh, by the security, uh, by, uh, by CSIS. So uh, what do we make of this? I mean, is professional oversight uh, uh, something that uh, we should uh, just expand uh, from the, uh, uh, the CERC uh, model to include the RCMP and other security agencies, uh, or should we get uh, the politicians involved? I think we maybe need to do both. I think uh, politicians need to get in uh, on some of these stuff, to get their hands dirty, uh, looking at uh, real uh, cases in the real time, uh, because they bring with them uh, a view from wherever they're from, they, from High River, from uh, Vancouver, uh, from Southern uh, uh, Ontario, Quebec, whatever, uh, they bring the common sense kind of view uh, to ask the questions that, uh, uh, that some might say, oh, that, that's a dumb question. Well, there, you know, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Uh, but uh, I think a, a combination like that, and, and one of the other valuable things about having a, a turnover of government is that sometimes uh, people who have been sitting in a particular seat know uh, from their own experience uh, what to ask about. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically of Wayne Easter, who was the Solicitor General in the last Liberal government, uh, who is now asking very good questions about uh, how the RCMP and security agencies are conducting their business. Now, I think uh, that kind of, uh, of uh, valu valuable uh, first-hand experience uh, is the kind of thing that uh, uh, a committee, a parliamentary committee, would certainly uh, benefit from. Uh, and I'm talking about a parliamentary committee that uh, is doing more than just approving the RCMP budget. I'm talking about some kind of a, 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 a committee that would actually get in there and in camera, if necessary, or when it's necessary, uh, be able to, uh, to uh, question uh, and say to people, show us the evidence. Could say to the, to the people that says, uh, who say, we've got a photo of me here in Afghanistan, to say, okay, bring it to the committee, let's see it. Um, I wanted to open the floor to uh, questions, but um, and then I'm going to save some time. We're going to wrap up at 5 to 12, but I want to save the last, um, last five minutes of that. So we'll cut the questions off at 10 to 12 because I want to bring us back to a question that I have for all of you, and that is what are the recommendations that you would make um, moving forward? So. Um, I'm thinking of the 90-odd people who've been named as apparently radicalized and targets of the RCMP. What if journalists start receiving um, phone calls about those people or those people's names are leaked? And, um, and I guess um, just recalling my own experience, which is very negative experience, having an argument with someone who still works for the RCMP, who is convinced that Meher Arar is a terrorist and asked me why, how is that inquiry, how is that a, a, a legitimate inquiry if he wasn't forced to testify and why wasn't he cross-examined? I mean, these are questions, it's so disturbing that there is still people working in, in those agencies who believe that and who haven't bothered to read the inquiry reports and the findings. Um, and so 
I guess in that context, I want, to, I want us to come back to recommendations going forward. But if we could just open it up and if I could ask you to um, I'll start with the mic in front here. And because there's so many questions, if we can keep them short, that would be great. Thank you. Um, um, my name is Randall Marlin. I teach at Carleton University. I want to thank the speakers for a very uh, valuable information. And I want to ask, um, in relation to the time when Meher Arar returned, it was clear that there was a preemptive strike. It looks like the RCMP, because they were, had the big interest in preserving their reputation. And uh, fr we fi find out that, uh, that we don't really know who was responsible in the RCMP for this preemptive strike, which was highly immoral because it dis worked to destroy Meher Arar's reputation. What they did was to send out information that had been obtained under torture. And that, as we know, is not credible information. So there was no business passing that information on to the press. Um, so that's my main question. I would like to thank uh, uh, Brigitte uh, for, um, uh, I can't read the last name, excuse me, uh, for, for uh, uh, that information about what is, was an, uh, an institutional RCMP lie passed on to you by a willing uh, but believing uh, RCMP officer. That's a very interesting case of what I would call institutional lying because the person who talked to you directly was not lying. The per person who talked to you directly believed what he was saying, but some higher up lied to him. And that's a very interesting situation which has many ramifications. That's why I think it's so important to pursue who was, who were these higher ups and bring them to public attention. That has not ha happened. When you read the O'Connor report, he says that's not within his terms of reference. But he leaves it cl quite clear that there's somebody that needs to be identified. Thank you very much. That is a very, very good point. And um, Justice O'Connor did name uh, some people that you know passed on information to the US uh, without all of the um, without all the prudence that they should have used. So there are, there are names of RCMP officers that were named, but not necessarily concerning the leaks. You are right. And, and, and it's, it, we'll talk about recommendations in a while, and that's where some, Jeff and I disagree sometimes on, on, on this, is a source. Like, for instance, this gentleman who gave me this information. There, you know, I agreed at the time, because he, he wouldn't talk to me otherwise, um, that I, I would continue listening to what he had to say, but then I would decide if I went on air with it or not, and I did not. But when you promise somebody that you will not name them, when you want to stay in the business a long time, you keep that promise, because it will come rapidly to the ears of others that you are a journalist that pretends you're going to protect your source, but you don't. So it, it, we're faced with very tough. You know, it would be easy now to say, oh, this, this was the name of the guy. If one day he wants to come out and say it, uh, that will be up to him. It would be easy for me to do that. But even on me, there would be big ramifications. Uh, we were faced with a very similar issue very recently. I was doing stories on um, a senator, anyway, that was uh, accused of sexual harassment. And one of the sources, one of the person I talked to I promised that I would not name her. I learned, I learned later on that she had lied about me. And I knew she had lied because I saw a report in which she talked about my calling her and we knew she had lied because I had, she did not know that I had recorded the conversations, which is legal as long as you don't use a, the, the information on air. And we were faced with the fact, do we go ahead and you know, say, no, this is not right, you've lied about our journalists, CBC, you've lied about our journalists, you lied about me, but then I would have had to go against our agreement of confidentiality. I will tell you every fiber of my body <laughs> wanted to say, I have the proof that you're lying about me, and now I know forever this will be in a report in the Senate, and it's untruth about me. But we made a decision not to do this because we were in the midst of a story where so many people were coming to me with information that was extremely important, extremely public interest, uh, and, and we did not want these people to think that I would turn on them uh, on first occasion. Maybe one day we will in certain occasions, but 
uh, for that specific one, we decided not to. And for those same reasons, we decided not to go ahead and name those people that were lying to us from the RCMP. But there's a potential path uh, you know, towards a solution, which is that if, if I'm given information and, and uh, it turns out that uh, I, I was lied to or given incorrect information, uh, I feel very strongly like Brigitte, uh, once I've given that undertaking, that promise that uh, their identity will be remain confidential, I'm not going to broach that. But certainly I don't feel any uh, restraint in terms of coming forward and saying, remember what I reported two weeks ago? That was wrong. Mm -hmm. And here are all the reasons why it's wrong. And, you know, I'll end up wearing it, but I still think uh, that's something that is my responsibility and uh, I can't... Uh, I, I, I also can't violate that promise. There's one time when I did violate it. It was a lady that gave me information. I went on air with it, and then she tried to sue me for using that information that she wanted me to put on air. So that one time I said, oh, okay, <laughs> this is not going to work. I'm going to use your name. If, if you don't you know, stop this lawsuit immediately, I will name you officially because this was ridiculous. She was, she was using me, you know, she didn't want to be named as a source, but then pretending she didn't give me the information and suing us on top of it. That was where I drew the line. <laughs> We're going to move on to the mic number two, please. And if I could just ask again that we keep the questions really brief. And so the gentleman at mic Carrie, number two. Uh, thanks. Wesley Ward, University of Ottawa. Um, first question, I'll package them all very briefly. Can I ask all of my journalistic colleagues at the front table to reflect back to the time when they were reporting on the Arar story uh, and tell us how much you knew about extraordinary rendition as a practice and if you had known about it, would that have changed the context of your reporting? Second, quickly, uh, the Juliet O'Neill decision uh, rendered null and void the uh, leakage provisions of the Security of Information Act. I'd be interested to know if that's changed your lives. Um, and so let me leave it at those two. Yeah. Jeff? Um, I don't think I knew uh, about extraordinary rendition uh, until uh, after the Arar uh, story broke and then we were uh, seeing reports of this uh, in U.S. media and we were trying to figure out, you know, hey, is this that kind of a case? Uh, so we didn't really have the background. Now, I don't know whether it was just out there and we, uh, we missed it, or, or uh, whether uh, it hadn't risen to prominence uh, uh, until after the, the Arar uh, story broke. Uh, and I'm sorry, Wes, your, your second? Julie oh, the Julie O'Neill case, yeah. Um, the Julie O'Neill case uh, involves a reporter, Julie O'Neill, who uh, received a leaked uh, document, uh, again, uh, raising questions about uh, Mayor um, uh you know, good civic responsibilities versus being a terrorist, you know, that kind of a, a, a thing in this document uh, that she used in the uh, story. Now, Julie uh, is a very good reporter, but she wasn't covering the uh, uh, the Arar case all along, uh, so she was coming to it fresh. So I suspect that uh, somebody sought her out uh, because uh, she was uh, willing to take uh, the information and didn't have all the background uh, uh, information to try to uh, put it all in context or, or to question, in fact, what, uh, uh, what had occurred. So uh, Julie made a, a kind of a, a, a real strategic error in writing her story. She talked about information from a document. Uh, and this got the Mounties all, uh, you know, all a flutter, you know. Uh, we've got a case of a leaked document. I mean, never mind uh, all the leaks uh, that are passed verbally. Uh, you know, th these are cops. Uh, and, you know, this is a case of theft. Somebody took a document. Uh, and so uh, her, on a very cold uh, winter morning, as I recall, uh, the cops showed up, the RCMP showed up at her uh, apartment, uh, in Centertown and uh, went through uh, her house, uh, took her computer hard drive, et cetera, et cetera, to try to uh, locate this, this document uh, and hopefully then find out who, who had leaked it. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a, a, a journalist uh, reporting daily anymore. I mean, has anybody asked the RCMP, hey, how is that investigation going into that? You know, uh, it would be a ridiculous question because 
the RCMP itself obviously leaked the document. Um, because we're running out of time, I'm going to ask you all to ask your questions, and if our panelists could take notes, um, then we'll answer them all in one go. So we'll start with you, Gar. Uh, thank you. In, a, in effect, the comment that I was going to make was just answered. It all relates to uh, Judith O'Neill's story on November the 8th, 2003, in The Citizen. Uh, what is interesting about it, but uh, Jeff has just mentioned that a document was involved. Now, what happened subsequently to that, where the RCMP decided to do an investigation, got a search warrant, went to our house, and went to our office. But what happened in government uh, after that, because up to that point, there was, I think in government, a pretty much a wall created saying there would be no public inquiry. But after the exercise of that search warrant, that is what led to the public inquiries with regards to my hero raw. That was my only footnote that I wanted to add to that story. Uh, incidentally, I was named in the same story, so I had the RCMP sleeping with me for a while, uh, but then they realized that I was not the source of such a document. I was retired and had access to nothing at that point. Thank you. Uh, to the second mic, please. Um, you spent a lot of time talking about what you do as journalists in terms of confirming sources and stuff like that. Um, I thought uh, right now today in Canada, nurses, doctors, lawyers, they can lose their licenses if they don't follow certain rules that are set out by their professional regulatory bodies. I guess I just want your thoughts about the state of um, Regu you know, the regulatory body that runs journal journalism, I think there's a press council, and my understanding is that it's not uh, very strong, or if it's toothless, or I guess you could just tell me if you think it's toothless, or what, it could, what could be done better to sort of make journalists follow a more consistent standard, the sort of standard you guys have shared with us today. And at, at the first mic, please. Uh, yes, I want to ask a question which goes a bit in another direction. You've enlightened us about uh, the challenges of specific cases from a journalistic point of view, but what about the more general context where in a war against terror, uh, terror is associated with a specific religion or nationals coming from a certain countries, and how you can deal with that so as not to contribute to uh, to uh, bias in the population or discriminatory uh, viewpoints. Because if Almaty, if it hadn't been Almaty, if it had been uh, uh, me, for example, driving the truck and it found uh, a map, they probably wouldn't have linked this map <laughs> to terrorism, right? So there's this aspect which has to be dealt with also. The, 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 we'll call it the Arab running around aspect. Mr. Windsor. <coughs> Uh, a brief obiter dictum, and then I'll go to my question. Uh, in in uh, credit to Julie, that in her story about the leaked document, she did include the fact that this was leaked to her because the RCMP was trying to diminish their culpability. Uh, and so at least there was uh, some clarification she didn't name who had leaked her, but uh, there was some clarification of why she got that document and how they were trying to, <clears throat> to spin. Uh, the, uh, I actually would uh, pose the question that uh, Jeff talked about renegotiating in the light of what uh, we've subsequently learned about uh, the conditions for anon anonymity. I would argue that that's not necessary. That that. The, the protection falls away, the protection of the promise or whatever of anonymity falls away if it subsequently becomes apparent that the source was uh, under the cover of anonymity deliberately trying to mislead for whatever purposes uh, the journalist uh, for protection or otherwise, and that, that if the fundamental arrangement was done under false pretenses, as indeed uh, much of the spinning around the RR case was uh, done under false pretenses, that the commitment to anonymity falls away. And uh, so I, I put that to you. Uh, secondly, I just asked Brigitte, did you, the Mountie you were dealing with 
didn't deliberately mislead you because he was misled, misled. But once he finally retired and all that, have you written the story about the fact that he was so upset about his instructions to mislead that he's quit the force? I did do a story on the fact that around that whole era, um, there were so many officers um, that were quitting and that they were going on sick leave. And I did do a story on that. And I did say that uh, these RCMP officers, some of them were leaving because of the RR story. So yes, I did report on that. I never named him then either. Um, I had interviews with RCMP officers that came forward, but I hid their faces in that story. Okay, just in the interest of time here, I'm wondering if somebody can answer the question specifically about um, the frame of terrorism being linked to a specific religion here, that it isn't, as we've heard a lot of people saying in the news, that um, it isn't a terrorist act unless it's somebody who's a Muslim involved. Um, there seems to be that requirement there. And um, I'm wondering if we can talk about how you deal with that. Um, anybody want to take that on? Well, I think uh, media in Canada have learned uh, from uh, many of the mistakes that were made um, in the immediate post-9-11 uh, area. In the reporting of the, uh, the two tragic uh, murders last week of, uh, of Canadian soldiers, uh, there has been peripheral reference to uh, who, uh, the, in the background of the, the two perpetrators, uh, how they might have been inspired by Al-Qaeda and so on. Uh, and I think it hasn't been overdone. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, in the current uh, climate we are going to start uh, pointing figure, fingers at a religion uh, as being the, the source of this difficulty. So it, we, I think we've uh, learned a hard lesson in that regard. I want to move on to the recommendations from this panel. Um, and I'm just going to start with one of my own, and that is, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just going to jump in here and say um, that anyone working in the field of national security, should, it should be part of, it should be required that they read the inquiry reports. Um, and, and if they're at all interested in the human side of that story, the book that was written on the cases, I, it's not a plug for me, but I think it's important that um, just having had arguments with current RCMP officers about these cases and, and realizing that they know absolutely nothing about the cases and yet form an opinion and act on that opinion. Um, that's my recommendation right there, is that they have to read the inquiry reports. Um, and if we could then move to Jacques and Brigitte and Jeff, and then we'll conclude. I think when you're in an environment where there have been uh, attacks and there's a level of fear in the populace, as a journalist, I think my biggest piece of advice is you need to take a deep breath, uh, be calm, and realize that uh, just because there's a heightened uh, level of anxiety, uh, it really doesn't change in any way, shape, or form what your responsibilities are. And, and I, 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 I want to harp on the point about to my, to my mind, when we're talking about information and leaks and things like that, it's, I think we should always be mindful that the more information that's in the public domain is the better, but it's all about how you frame it. And I know that we, we talked about the Juliet O'Neill and the documents provided to her, but there was an alternate way to frame that story, which would be, uh, essentially, the government has now given me the case against Meher Arar. And it's primarily made up of information obtained under torture, and the rest of it is, is uh, a bunch of suppositions and suspicions, and really there's no, very little, if any, hard evidence. And, and to me, that's a, val that's a valid story. That gets it into the public domain, but it's the way in which it's framed, and it, in essence, it challenges it. Uh, and I take Hugh's point, uh, I mean, uh, Juliet was very clear about th there was a uh, you know agenda attached to it, but I do think you know the when you looked at what was there, uh, I think there was a pretty compelling case to make the story that uh, you know at, at the heart of this case was was not very much, if anything. As lesson learned, I think the two the two sources thing. If you're a journalist, um, to have a second source and a third source sometimes. And sometimes we're dealing with stories, we'll have lawyers around the table and they will say, 
we don't have enough. Like we have to go get more. And it's frustrating because sometimes you feel you have a good story, you wanna go on the air, but it's good to have all that, uh, those people around you that are saying, we need more, we, we have to be sure on this. So the more sources you have, the better. And one thing I've learned with this is that the police is one source like any other. Um, because you know, in that context too, you have the RCMP calling, it, it can seem like a very credible force. You have police officers telling you stuff. They're the people on the investigating. Now I know that RCMP, police, whatever, they are one source. Especially if they're telling you stuff confidentiality, under confidentiality, it has to be dealt as any other sources would. And um, just a, a word of advice to, to, to the public too. At, at one point when we were covering this, and I'll say this really quickly, but. We had trouble covering this story at one point because there was nothing new happening in it. And it will sound so superficial and harsh what I'm gonna say, but we're news media. So we need new stuff to go on air. So at one point, we were do, doing stories on Maher Arar being detained in uh, Syria. And, and when he came back and that he wanted to have a, uh, an inquiry, I know that people were frustrated that we weren't talking about it enough. And at one point, Monia Mazik became very good at understanding that dynamic, and Carrie helped her a lot with that, in understanding that at one point she, she organized vigils, and she had a demonstration, she went to the US Embassy, and so she was giving us an excuse to go back to our desk editors and say, listen, there's something new, say, ah, oh, our story again, no, we've covered this, and no, no, but I have another angle, look, they're doing this at the US Embassy, and in doing so, I was able to put in those stories a little other tidbits of information I'd gathered along the way, but didn't justify a story in itself. So when people have a story they believe in, they have to have to give impression of movement. You know, you have to have something happening to feed the machine. It sounds harsh, but that's basically the way it goes. Um, in terms of recommendations for news organizations, uh, I think I'll draw on my experience teaching uh, young uh, journalists in training uh, and the amount of pressure that they are under today to get the story out quickly because of, uh, we're dealing in a digital 24-7 uh, kind of news environment. Uh, and editors from time to time uh, can go overboard. They'll be trying to push the story a little harder than it needs to be. Uh, want to uh, torque it uh, is a, a phrase that's frequently used. Now, if you're a young reporter, it's hard to resist that pressure. So I would urge um, news organizations uh, to have somewhere in their chain of command, uh, off to the side, a, an ethics counselor or ethics advisor that any person in the newsroom can go to uh, and uh, complain that uh, they are feeling uncomfortable about a particular story uh, and uh, they uh, don't want to do what an editor has asked them to do. This is a, a tremendously empowering thing, I think, for young people, to know that there's somebody who's going to uh, trust their judgment, uh, that as the reporter, they're, they're the closest to the story, uh, and so editors need to uh, trust the judgment of the reporters, whether they're, you know, 25-year-old uh, uh, rookies or, you know, 60-year-old uh, uh, folks uh, who've been around quite a bit. I just want to close by um, pointing out there's a story to cover on this. Um, Michelle Cabana, who was in charge of the investigation into all of these men, um, he testified at a committee this week and he made excuses for the mistake that was made about whether um, the young fellow had wanted to travel to Saudi Arabia or Syria and said, oh, it was just a mistake, it was this and that. This is the same person who has since been, he was the head of, the, of AO Canada, the investigation that led to what happened here. And he's now seen as the person who's testifying. Nobody held him to account there. There was no sort of, aren't you the guy who was in charge of that investigation that made all sorts of mistakes? Um, and what are the lessons learned there? And, and aren't we seeing that that lesson hasn't been learned right now with you saying that here, that this was a small mistake and doesn't matter? So I just, I just want to highlight that there's a good story to be told there. <laughs> it's a lot of the same players now speaking to the current issues um, in the news. Um, I want to thank our panelists. And um, I really thank you very, very much. I know it's hard to get a day away. And I really want to say thank you.